the nice your tea. I see the little tea thing there. You get a little tea going, real relax. Right, has anybody else who had not seen Jesus Revolution seen it since last week? So y'all, so what do you think? What is wild? No, you're supposed to go there. So y'all both saw it? Awesome. Did you like it? Did you think it was weird? Did you think it was, is there any thoughts? I mean, I liked it. I mean, there's some things that I was not expecting as far as, like, just, I mean, I hadn't heard much about it. Kind of there, but, uh, a few things that went into it I wasn't expecting to go into, so I mean, it's good to see the, yeah. the not just hit the high points or what the main like, what was, like, the most gospel was. Like, here's, 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 here's the, here's a the, sanitizer. Here, here's the doctor that you don't get anything else between, and so, that's what I really love about what's happening in Christian art right now is it, 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 they have gotten away from all that. You know, it's not just Moses, the the Ten Commandments, and the show. You know, it's not. It's it's a lot more real. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I listen to Christian podcasts because you know I got it forever, <laughs> and he's sarcastic, and I love him because of that. But he had made a thing about the Jesus Revolution and Mormonism. Like a connection. Yep. And I just didn't know if y'all knew about that. Oh, or the Jesus that Revolution. Was... I know about the chosen. All its connections. Maybe it was chosen. chosen. Maybe it was the chosen. chosen yeah. But um, I could just be thinking Jesus Revolution too. I didn't know if y'all saw any of that mm -hmm. in there. No, uh, there's definitely a connection with the chosen and the Mormons, only in the sense of this: there are some folks that are Mormons that are on their staff and stuff, and they use a lot of their. One of their sets is, was donated to them by the Mormon Church, so they go up to Utah to film a lot of it, and so it created all these conspiracy theories. It's really Mormonism. I mean, I test everything on there. I don't see any of it in the chosen. But now I haven't I've seen any of that related to the Jesus Revolution. Have, have y'all? But now that's a strong. If you, if you Google the chosen, bad things with the chosen, that's the first thing you'll hear: Mormonism and all this kind of stuff. I saw some trick on Instagram. Yeah, they have like a. I think. Dallas likes to kind of troll people a little bit. I do too. Um, somebody wrote in there, they had a picture of something, and, and talk, they're talking about the relationship you know, thing with si uh, what's the, uh, Thomas and his girlfriend. Mm -hmm. And they were like, you know, I'm, I'm trying, I'm just, I want you to get away from these love triangles. I'm, you know, get back to preaching Jesus and the gospel. And Dallas is like, well, you've had the Old, the old Testament then, because that's about what it's all about. <laughs> that's good, so, good point. Good so it's point. kind of like, you, you can't please everybody. And I've even seen some critics about the even the movie saying, like, they, they didn't preach enough about Jesus. You got you got the picture. It's not like they have to just hammer it literally. Have a revolution out. Oh. Jesus revolution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I've heard some folks say that too. A little bit of criticism on that. And I want to go. You know, go to church every day. You'll hear that. Right. This is different. It's different. It's built for a different audience. And, and I just I I really really appreciate it. I really appreciate it because it's again it's, it's opening the eyes to people who will not do, darken the door of a church. Which I think is a good thing. A good thing. Again, as long as it's theologically sound, and all. not to mention this, it's a love story. Number one, Greg Laurie, the love story of him and his wife. But it's also a, it's a quasi historical of Chuck Smith, Lonnie, Lonnie, and the. And that's another thing. You Google Lonnie, you get to hear all the things that happened to him. He he went off to Florida, got out of the, out of Christianity for a while, engaged in homosexuality. Wound up ultimately. He repented, got back into the ministry for the last part of his life, uh, but died of AIDS. So there, there's a, that's what I mean. This stuff is real, and these are real people who with real struggles, who God used mightily, kind of like David. Oh, that's an Old Testament love triangle again. Uh, it's like David. Yeah, God uses sinful people. That's what we are. That's what we're and, talking about today. And we, and we just got to beat this out of our what I always call our baby Baptist view of things. You know, we have we tend to put on our moral. And y'all know me. Y'all know me when I say this. I'm not saying live the way you want to. I believe in righteousness and morality. But we tend to put that on. We tend to define morality. Let me say it like this. We tend to define morality. Immorality is anything I'm not doing. <laughs> we tend to define it from our own point of view. It's like, quit it. Stop it. Stop it. Right, anyway, I'll, say I'm already on. Okay. I'll, I'll get off that. Okay. Go. Okay. So, engaging the culture this week, um, we just found this clip. I don't know if anybody saw this, but... Um, yeah, this is engaging the culture this week. This is about a, a high school student in Canada who was arrested. Okay, did you start that back up? Mm -hmm. Yeah, did anybody see this? I think it was on Fox News, this one. Okay, maybe not. <laughs> Might need to refresh it. Huh? Might need to refresh it. Yeah, 
Um, I skipped the um, commercial for y'all, but they always find me. Yeah, you're always gonna get And we have scrolling too. Yeah, we didn't test any of this today. We really need it. Well, I thought it called for this, so I thought it could work. Because they never could have all these extra notes here. Okay. Um. You guys, my aunt swears by this, it's completely transformed her life. All of her friends and family are freaking out There's over her because she's been dropping 13 pounds week after week. We can talk about weight loss today. But it's from a video and it's so effective. It's even been featured on multiple news outlets, including NBC. How many Americans pay attention to Canada? The entire country could disappear and it wouldn't make the nightly news. Here. But we watch what's happening in Canada because it's fascinating. How does such a nice country become totalitarian so quickly? Are there lessons for us? Well, for example, a high school student in Canada has been arrested for declaring that men and women are different. Josh Alexander attended St. Joseph's High School, Catholic High School in Renfrew, Ontario. He was barred from school from the grounds for saying that God created two genders, because that's kind of a Christian precept, but also common sense. When he showed up for class, police arrested him. You can see it on your screen right now. So we thought it'd be worth talking to him. And now we are. Josh Alexander and his lawyer, James Kitchen, join us. Thanks to you both for coming on. Josh, first to you. Um, you were arrested? because you showed up on campus at a Catholic school for saying that men and women are different. Have we overstated that? No, that's exactly what happened. Um, there, were, there was a lot of steps that uh, it took to get to that point, but uh, female students complained to me and uh, they said they were concerned because males were using their washrooms. This turned into a debate at the school. Yeah. They did my opinion on They removed me from the building uh, for the remainder of the year, and when I attempted to attend class, I was arrested and charged. Did you point out that this is a Christian school and that this is like a core Christian idea because it's like in the Christian book, which some call the Bible? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I actually tried to have that discussion with my uh, administrators, but they, they refused to do so. Uh, Mr. Kitchen, my, my apologies, by the way, uh, on what's happened to your, I think, great country. Um, do, what's your recourse legally in Canada? Well, it's limited, of course, um, because our constitution is much weaker um, and because there seems to be culturally uh, and legally much less respect for individual rights and freedoms and much more interest in um, you know, government having the kind of power to do what it wants. Um, but there is recourse to the, uh, the Ontario Human Rights Commission in this case. Um, we think there's been religious discrimination on the basis of Josh's Christian religious beliefs, so we're going to file a complaint to the Ontario Human Rights Commission. Um, and there is recourse through the board itself as far as appealing these disciplinary decisions, and we hope to explore that as well. I, I mean, Fidel Castro's son takes over your country, and all of a sudden it becomes human? Like, it's just shocking. Josh, quickly to you. The police officers who arrested you, a high school student, for quoting the Bible in a Christian school, must have been ashamed of themselves, I would hope. Did they seem embarrassed? Um, I wouldn't say so. I've had a lot of experience with police over the last couple of years, uh, just through the Freedom Convoy and other events like that. And uh, the police state is quite embarrassing in our country. So, no, they, there was no different response from them. Uh, are you going to continue high school? I'm certainly going to try to. I would hope that my personal beliefs wouldn't uh, exclude me from uh, an education, but it would appear that's the way it's going to be. It's, it's an unbelievable story. I hope you'll both come back. Thank you. Josh Alexander. Isn't that wild? Isn't that wild? Just the reason we did this is engaging the culture. Man, that's a high school kid engaging the culture. If you, oh, by the way, if you've seen Jesus Revolution, do you all know how this is one criticism I had of Rumi? Uh, Jonathan. Jonathan. You're not allowed to have criticism. Yeah, this great kid criticizes the, the actor Jesus. No, the criticism, not, I haven't, not my criticism, but it's criticism from what I've heard is, it's a light criticism. The, the idea that he's like in his 40s. Do you know how old, um, what's his name? Frisbee was? Oh, excuse me, let, let me go back. I forget how old. Frisbee was probably like 22, 23. Oh, yeah. Do you know how young um, uh, uh, Greg Laurie was? He was 17, 17 years old. He was in high school. 
So the agent, if that, if that blows your mind when you see what you saw in, in Jesus' revolution and then you adjust, because the actors are all older than what they really were. When you adjust what they really were, anyway. And I, Kelsey Grammer is older. Yeah, Kelsey Chuck Grammer Smith was much older. Chuck Smith was in his 40s. Yeah, Chuck so. Smith was in his 40s. Uh, so anyway, I only mention that because you see this guy, this, this is a high school kid. It's a high school kid. He's a who's, peculiar person. He's a peculiar person. Isn't that cool? We just showed a video of the guy in Canada. Like, no, like, no, you're good, you're good. You didn't change your clock. I know what you did. <laughs> no, I didn't. I went to bed after midnight too. So, <laughs> well, so how are you supposed to continue it's to good to be here. this young child if he's out of school to be I know it's a paradox. It is a paradox. Normally they try to arrest the kids the parents for not having their kids in school. Right. Now they kick them out. What about the Catholics? I would say, where's the priests or whatever who's head of their church? Yeah. Is it you hear of they're called Anglicans, right? Is Anglican? that the word, right? There's like the Anglican is, is changing to be like that. And they're actually, I forget his name because I'm terrible with names, but he has a really nice accent anyway. Um, so I can remember, but he was saying stuff that lined up with like what Protestants believe. And he was basically saying that like, you have these people that are trying to change the Bible. And he's like, it's been like this for the past 2000 years and before, like it's, it's not that we're bigots or anything like that. It's like, this is just the truth. This is, and he did it in a loving manner, and he's an Anglican. So it just kind of goes to show that it's not just Protestant. It's not just that. Like, it's it's trickling down in everywhere. It's all over the place. Yeah, a, lot of, a lot of the podcasts I listen to, there's a story on Canada every single week. Canada is, it, it, it's wild what's happening in Canada right now. Canada has fallen. It has completely fallen. It has. Probably beyond any kind of repair. I mean, to so jump far. in with what you just said, um, I think what we're seeing is, and it hit me last night, I think what we're seeing is, is we're seeing a separation of um, cause and effect with regard to logic and with regard to reality. And we've already been told to deny reality, but, but when Mohammedanism took over back in whatever, 12th century, whatever, part of Mohammedanism was to separate cause and effect. How do you do that? We're seeing that right now. Right. And we, we, we could get off we could get off into some of this stuff here, but you're right. If you watch the news and all, think of it that way. It's a separation of cause and effect. You get these ultra radical socialist liberals arguing for fill in the blank, whether it's abortion, whether it's um, whether it's a drug use and all that kind of stuff. Well, there is a, an effect. Common sense rationality goes, oh, crime is spiking, teenage suicide is spiking. Um, uh, 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 females, so is that uh, uh, eating disorders, massive depression, especially among young females. You ask the same question to them and go, well, then we need more marijuana, more. There's a complete dis disconnect from cause and effect. That's exactly what it has done. And it's amazing how, it's, how it has permeated the reasoning, especially of our younger generation. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. When I was sort of in C, we, that's the, that is the default younger generation, and, and I, I can't argue that. But we just, somebody just said it a minute ago. It's every generation. The adults yeah. are condoning it. You're right, yes. you're right. Mm -hmm. So, That's but different. you know what I think the difference is? I think uh, the young generation are being indoctrinated and falling for it. This is this is my more conspiracy, conspiratorial side. The older generation knows exactly what they're doing. They know what they're doing and deliberately disconnecting the two. Because they want to change culture. Wow. Y'all feel like they're gaslighting us? <laughs> Probably. Crazy. Yeah, keep going. Okay, so one more engaging the culture. Y'all might have seen if you if you're on my Facebook, I posted this. I know Hillary has. <laughs> this is my neighborhood. Um, as you enter close to our house, there's a cross in the common space, and. Um, every year, uh, a little family, the Wilkerson's and their kids decorate this cross. It's their, like a family tradition in our neighborhood. And um, they forgot to take the cross down uh, during the pandemic. So it stands all year long, but at Easter they decorate it. Um, and so I, it just struck me, I kept, I, I always leave the neighborhood that way. And so every morning I'm like, oh, you know, and then, I, it made me think of Dr. Heiser's cosmic geography, if y'all were with us when we studied that. Um, 
the idea that God at the Tower of Babel divorced the nations and then he put Elohim in charge of all these areas. But we are God's people and we are staking a claim of cosmic geography. Uh, so I couldn't really say that in a Facebook post where someone would understand, but y'all understand that this to me brought the scriptures to, to mind Joshua 24 15 and if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord choose this day whom you will serve whether the gods the Elohim of your fathers your father served in the region beyond the river or the Elohim of the Amorites and those in whose land you now dwell but as for me and my house state the claim but as for me and my house we will serve the Lord and then also um, this time of year, Philippians 2, 8 through 11, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to glory of God the Father. And there's your cosmic geography. There's your cosmic geography. On earth, in heaven, on earth, and even under the earth. One day we'll stop and go back to that cosmic geography and maybe spend one week on just what <coughs> the examples of cosmic geography in the Bible. But that is cool. What are you going to say on that? Alright, so that was engaging the culture. So our neighborhood family engaged the culture by throwing a cross out there. And this guy engaged the culture by being thrown out of school and thrown in jail. Have y'all engaged the culture this week? <laughs> You're up. Anybody? Anybody want to share anything? Anything? Any interesting conversations? Anything happened this week? So, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you, you give it to God and let Him kind of take it. You know, and, and whatever you do is not going to surprise Him. You know, so if you're if you're saved, it's not like you're going to lose that, right? Um, but at the end of the day, you have to, you know, at a certain point, I've always felt this way. Like you have to take care of you as well as if you're not, you're not taking care of yourself. You can't take care of other people. And I've seen people that they'll stay in bad situations just because, okay, this is the right thing to do. It's kind of like, okay, well, is it worth the next 50 years of your life where you're just dragging somebody down the road and they're not going to walk the rest of the marriage? It's really, it has to be two people that want the same thing. And if you're trying to talk to him and he's not listening, you know, it's time to say, okay, well, we, how, how do we go from here type thing? And, and really, you know, bring God into that without, I'm not saying make any rash decisions, but, you know, this is, this is kind of what, you know, like the revolution move, like this is kind of what real life is. It's not just black and white. And I, and I know some people that feel like, okay, you got to do this. Well, it's not all that simple. You know, it's just one of those things where you have to figure out what you are willing to live with and tolerate and what you're not. And if somebody's not pulling their weight and doing what they need to do, you got to make some decisions. And so I, and I told her, I was like, I'll be praying for you. And I, I hope everything goes well. But you know, just take it one day at a time and just give it to God that he's not going to be surprised. If he's, I, I've heard one speaker say before, not here, another church, that they, if they said you really can't disappoint God. God already knows everything that's, that's going to happen. So it's not going to surprise him. It's not going to be like, oh, I can't believe they did that. You know, he already knows. So well, That doesn't that, mean he doesn't weep, though. Right. But at the same time, it, it does mean that he is still in control and that he can control every situation. But I, I don't know. It's just kind of one of those things where I, I hope that it was a, she seemed to be encouraged by it and everything. Cause like I said, I wasn't telling her what to do, but just trying to encourage her. Just, wow. It's keep your eyes and ears open and Paul, keep praying. Paul struggles with that so much because you remember where, this this is hard. Like you said, there are nuances here, but it's part of working out your salvation with fear and trembling. But Paul struggles with that so bad. Cause you remember where he's gone. I forget, you'll know me. Go, is it Romans? You remember where he's working through He's talking about the freedom in Christ, and then he said, then they says, then does that mean that we can sin as much as we want? He says, may it never be. Right. And you and you keep reading, and he goes back and forth and back. He's not going back and forth because he's changed his mind. He's going back. What he's doing is he's running through a this fine balance between freedom in Christ and grace, which is free, but righteousness, which is a responsibility in our and our and our our reaction to the gift of God's grace is righteousness and, and how that plays out in real life is is very difficult. Do you want to say something? Well we 
I want to ponder out loud the word reconciliation. What you just said, say to, my, say to me, vocabulary words you just used. No, I don't want to say that. <laughs> it's so, and, and you said rubber meets the road with regard to, you know, I do think things are black and white. That's, that's, that's hard to come out and allow. I do think things are black and white. I do believe God is sovereign. I do believe I can barely spell that word sometimes but I have no clue what it means. Um, but we're, and you mentioned earlier that God, Jesus died on the cross. I, I've heard that all my life. I don't think I've ever fully spent eight, 12, two, two days pondering that deeply and what that really means. And, and then you mentioned the word righteous. I'm, I'm supposed to live righteous and holy in response to what he's doing. That's and saying, he's yeah. coming back. And everybody thinks he's going to be coming back. And like, here comes Jesus down the road, you know, like palm leaves and hope. He's coming back, I think, with a bloody sword and angry because of our lack of of grasping that he's paid it all and that he became sin and was separated from his holy father and I, I, I stand the blood right through it and, and I'm, I don't process these things at a, at a level of depth I'm thankful that I've lived long enough to get to be part of these things out loud but is he really going to be angry at us the children of God, or is he going to be angry at those, those who have rejected? Those who have rejected that, you know. Because <laughs> <laughs> we come with Cause, him. Because he actually Sorry. comes. Because it says he will, he will start. In Revelation 19. He, he will, that's what I was going to say. Well, actually, before that, he'll press. Well, the, we the, fully, the, fully, his fully. garments are covered in the blood of his enemies. That, that's the description of Jesus. Sacred, but, when, you're, but when I see the question is, who are those enemies? When I see him willfully, the iniquity and the transgression and stuff. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think, the more I ponder, I think I'm just cruising along on thin air and ice, thinking I've got this figured out, and that you know, I'm a son of God because I, I actually. I, I, I reject some of the things about that. I just, this fear and trembling thing, uh, I, we're sa I'm, I'm saved by grace. I'm thankful for that. And it's a gift from the Lord. But the willy nilly -ness that I can do with this, and the thoughts that still come into my head that I have to like, ah! <laughs> We need to go back think, and look at that with Paul. I, I think though that this with. is you're being removed from the power of sin over your life. Mm -hmm. The penalty is already paid. I can't argue the that. power is removed, but you won't be removed from the presence of sin until the day of the Lord. Mm -hmm. like, and being removed alive. from the power of sin is a day by day thing with failures. That's right. that's David. That's David. Look at David. David's like a man after God's own heart. How the God, God's own heart praised over and over again about the Old Testament, the New Testament, a man after God's own heart, but you saw the failure. With God, when God returns, is he coming to exercise his wrath on David? Wait, wait. That doesn't even make sense. Because David was was doing this and he failed. So do we jump in there? Okay. From my race in Southern Baptist tradition brain. <laughs> That's a very lot of our discussions. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. But um, I was always told it's like you put on your Jesus jersey or you put on your, the enemy's jersey. It's like that's the that's who you're gonna wear today. But you put it into perspective with the cosmic geography. So and it, I think of it as like okay, 
this is the kingdom of God. Jesus is the ruler. So like I am no longer in this kingdom of darkness and death, right? Like I've been raised again in life. I am a new weeks in Colossians. creation. Like Colossians. I am legit not the same person. And that doesn't mean like when you're saved, you're going to look the same because that's just, that's just ridiculous. Like it could happen to just me, but I want to teach you. But I think what, what he was saying, which struck me, is that like when I do sin, I'm saying, nah, fam, I don't want that. I want this. And it's saying like, even though I'm a part of this kingdom, I'm going back and I want this death. I want this stuff. And um, I think that that's kind of like, I mean, if I, with my students, when I've given them this and then like they don't take it, I'm I'm angry and rightly so because I'm like, are you stupid? You know? And oh, so, stupid yeah, I'm like, what? And so I think that may I could be wrong, probably am. Most times I am when I think through stuff, but maybe that's that kind of anger. Like he's just like angry and upset and weeping because like why did why did you choose that? There's something so much better. I don't know necessarily if that's going to be the anger coming at Revelations because if I'm honest, I still don't understand that book. But um, it's fine, you know, because people don't understand Old Testament until later. And well, in, in my mind, I separate those two. The, the anger, the description in Revelation of Christ's return, he is coming to pour, it's, it's, the, it's the wrath of the Lamb. He is coming, coming to pour out the wrath. So the question I have to ask is, on whom? And of course, we're not objects of, Christ, of God's wrath. See, I see this as two completely different things. First, first of all, I'm also a premillennialist, uh, excuse me, um, um, pre-tribulation rapture person too. So when Christ returns, we ain't been here. We're coming back with him. So his wrath is not directed towards Christians who have failed in that sense, in the, in the second coming of the revelation. With, with now, what you're, what, where, where you are, what you're saying there is, I completely and we break the heart of God just like your children do. When we are children of the King and we disobey just like your children will do, when they disobey you and do something radically against what you've taught them and have chosen a lifestyle or crazy or made a serious mistake, your heart is massive. So I completely agree that we can ridiculously, that's not a good, ridiculously, uh, grieve the heart of God as his children, but it doesn't remove us from the family. We are never objects of his wrath. We are objects of his discipline. We're objects of bringing him, us being brought back into right relation with him within his family. The objects of wrath that, that the lamb will be bringing back in Revelation are of those who are, like those who are, those who have rejected him. That's the object. So I, I see those as two. Does that help at all with what you're saying? And so in other words, sanctification is for the believer. A failure in sanctification can break the heart of God, can bring serious discipline, can even bring death. Death is discipline. The mean, but it doesn't, what it can't bring is removing you from the family. Now, that's why I, that's why I was describing it as difficult. But, but, does Demas fit what about that model? Sin? Does Demas fit that model? Demas, explain. <sighs> Demas was completely given over. Demas was listed in one chapter, one book. I mean, he was he was in the club. Oh, that's right. The one who would do. Paul says that he's departed from. Can us. I give you a modern day example? Yeah, well, let me just say this. But see, this is what I mean. This is what gets hard. You kind of get into Presbyterian. You get into all the different kind of views of theology. The question there would be for me, and it's, I think it's an unanswerable question. The question there would be was Demas was Demas, was Demas okay. ever saved? Right. So he was, was he being sanctified, or was he just simply a false prophet? He was listed as one of the the as one of the movement the movement makers in, right. in one book, and so I I have to I have to believe that yes, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. That he was part of the the Billy Graham Crusade team, you know, back in the day, and but so was Judas. <laughs> yeah. And what did he do with Judas? Judas was called. But a Judas disciple. was not part of the Acts. I mean. I don't know. I, my heart goes. My heart goes out to Lot's wife. <laughs> that's not Lot's wife. Lot himself. Yeah. Oh, that's Lot's wife. We're actually going to talk about. Don't talk about Lot. Oh, that's right. We're going to get to Lot. Oh, um, that's a great example. Hey, because wait, I, I will say this. Because where does Lot show up in the New Testament? In the Hall of Fame. He is, said, he is determined to be a righteous man. 
that completely blows our mind when we study a lot in the Old Testament. I miss that. But in the New Testament, he's a righteous man. So that's what I mean. It's this. Well, then there's hope. There's hope. <laughs> <laughs> there's hope. Can I say something real quick? I love that, that, that That was an eye-opening spot for me when somebody says, where's God in the New Testament? He's in the chapter of faith and declared as righteous. Whoa, that totally changes what was going on. The old. It makes you see it as a sanctification issue, not a salvation issue. Okay, real quick. Uh, anybody? Um, oh, by the way, Meredith did say that we were going to just skip this because we did it last week. I said no. That's why we did the handout. So see, we're we're sitting right here again. Know, this diagram is important. Keep going. Um, so, what was the question? Oh, yeah. Oh, I know. Um, anybody come to Sunday night service last week? From the Sunday night service here. Um, so, uh, Pastor Chip interviewed a couple who he was a pastor for many, many years, preached the gospel, the gospel, preached over and over, studied the word, went to seminary as a lead pastor at Ocean Springs, and went, he did not truly give his testimony, but I listened to him online because I was fascinated. On the way back from Birmingham last week, we were listening to it, knowing that we were going to get here just in time to hear him in person, so, so we actually heard all this testimony he for you. Was preparing for a sermon and reading scripture about sin and that no one who continually sins habitual sin, habitual sin could be part of the kingdom of God and he was convicted about his homosexuality that he had hidden from his wife his whole married life of 12 years from his pastorate from everything and he knew he said at that moment he knew he was not, was not saved Wait, but how does that work with the death warrant conference? Because he was actually saved in the death warrant. Kay Arthur. I mean, Kay Arthur. So he was convicted, but okay. he still was immobile. He couldn't fathom telling his wife and confessing. And That's true. Then he went with his wife on an anniversary trip to a Kay Arthur marriage retreat. And sitting by her, and he's, she's pouring over the scripture, and he's getting convicted more. <laughs> and, he, and, you know, and he goes, if they ask us to come forward, I can't. If they ask us to raise, I can't raise my hand. I can't. My wife is right here. You know, asking for whoever has made a profession of faith. But Kay Arthur didn't. She said, raise your eyes and look at me. He and said, I can do that. He opened his eyes and looked at her, and she saw him. And he's, like, bawling. And his wife, like, noticed that he's crying, but she didn't really understand. And it was not until later that he confessed to her. That I, we've got to talk. Anyway, it's an incredible, incredible testimony. But that that's what baffles me. But then when I was reading and studying for this, this week in Galatians, the walking by the Spirit chapter, and the, right before that, it, it lists all, all these, <laughs> it lists all these uh, sins, sins. And it says the person who practices these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then I went and looked at practices, and it's habitually, continually living in a sin. A local right. pastor who remained nameless in the last three years said from the pulpit, I could stand up here and fake it, and you would never know. I think that's true. From the pulpit. Well, I think and that's, that's what you're saying. Yeah. And Especially with the, the way, with the way we... <laughs> Teach in modern 21st century, 21st century evangelical Christianity, Baptist and others. The way we do it, I think it makes it very easy to do that. You just need a good personality and a good and a good uh, course. Uh, you know, yes, I, I think that's very true. So, very true. Do you want to do holiness? Oh, let's see. Because I mean. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. That's such a good video. Yo, we have three good videos, including one from The Chosen. Garrett's got something. Yes. Oh, Garrett. I was just thinking, like, going back to the whole battle scan we were talking about earlier. I mean, I think it comes back to what we're talking about. Y'all talked about it. It's believing loyalty. And what is believing loyalty? That's why this diagram is so important. That's here. That's you stating that believing loyalty, which is what you were saying. Go ahead. I feel like to some degree, like we talk about Demas and even even thinking of another, or maybe some to some degree like uh, like uh, from the chosen or from the Prisby. Like, like Prisby. It's like 
I can't think that what he was going on in that Jesus movie was him faking it. I feel like if that was actually happening, if that's if it's historical, that was him being used by the Holy Spirit. But he did turn away from God. But then came back. Again. But came back. So I mean, I feel like there is an ability to remove yourself from. We have the ability to remove ourselves from God voluntarily remove ourselves from God's family in that sense if we remove our the loyalty we choose to follow make that conscious decision to follow someone besides God I mean and that's I know that kind of flies in the face of the one saying I always say but I, and that's that's because I, I mean at least me thinking out loud that's where I'm my head goes and but ultimately like the line of truth but he did come back where it's like and like Demas would have had the opportunity to come back just like Lonnie did. Right. And um, Demas but, would have but we have that. We have huh. God will God will not sit there and hold us in, in His family if we don't want to be there. That's now His, great his, now his grace His grace is sufficient. We, his grace we, His 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 he, His grace is sufficient to cover anything. But we have to once again we can remove our willingness to be covered by His grace. That's Absolutely, a great way of putting it. You cannot. God will never. God will not reject you, but you can reject God. For so you can walk away. God will never reject a heart coming to him. His family, he wants you back. But you I love the way he said that. Here's what Heidi used to always say. It took me a long time to understand this. When he's talking about um, Egypt, Moses comes down, they're worshiping the golden calf. You remember when it is the golden calf, so, where the earth opened up and ate up three thousand of them? Yes. And they and they're and so here's what Heidler always says. He goes, when, when he's what he's talking about is when somebody asks him questions, this idea about elect, your elect, one read into that New Testament once they always say elect. And what he said, he says, I can tell you what, there are no bell worshippers in heaven. In other words, and it's, it's and his point is it's what you said. In other words, earth opened up eight, three thousand people. Those were Israelites, they were elect. He goes, But there are no bell worshippers in heaven. They're worshiping Baal. He said, well, what he pointed to, he said, it's believing loyalty. He said, you can, he said, that's his point, is that believing loyalty is what you place in God. It's the only thing you bring. What's the only thing you do for your salvation is you have to believe. Faith. Yeah, faith. That's what it is. Faith, faith. Don't say your quote. Believe, say your quote. Yeah. They Although, so well, that's why I say the loyalty part. Yeah. Say your quote. Mm -hmm. uh, belief is the enemy of knowing. Yes. To remember. That's good. That's, that's why I always use the word believing loyalty. I had the word believe because when we teach this, what is John 3 16? If I don't believe, like we know John 3 16, you flip over two books and it's the demons believe and shut it. So that's why I always say English, English is what your enemy is there. It's not belief. If you look at the Greek, they trace it back to the Hebrew word out of the out of the uh, Septuagint. And guess what's what is mashed into all of the Greek and the Hebrew there? It's loyalty. If you do a word search on what that is, it's loyalty. That's what believing is. Believing is an English word. What it is, is your pleasure. And it goes back to what you were saying. It's Colossians. It's God has taken you from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. When will you place your believing loyalty in him? You are exiting one kingdom, entering. It's all a battle. And human beings are both the pawn and the prize of the battle. We're the pawn being manipulated by both the dark world and being called by God. We're the pawn in this battle. But we're also the prize. And the question is, will you, will, you be, will you be the treasure of Satan or will you be the treasure of God? Are you being brought back into the family? It is a, it is a spiritual battle built around loyalty. That's why I so y'all y'all were here for those discussions of, of loyalty. But I agree. I don't like using the word believe me. That's an English word. It's not believing, it's believing loyalty. It's faith. The thing that comes to my mind that we've been talking about, it's in the New Testament when the guy who was in, they said he was in sexual sin and habitual, they were like, you have to get rid of him. You have to kick him out. Yeah. And then the practice with the Israelites and the goats, there was one goat that they sacrificed to Christ, to God, sorry. Yeah. And then there was one goat that they said they put Same. all their sins on and they kicked him out. Because, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And because it, it's like, you're going to his domain. And so it's kind of so like push him into the wilderness, which was the domain of the spirits, so the like, lesser gods. If you reject <laughs> being God's family and you're at the church, then the church discipline is to you can't be on this holy ground. You've got to go. You're no longer in this kingdom. This is not your place. I'll give you one nuance for this, and I, I need to look at this a little deeper. I don't remember if this was Heiser or who this was from, or one of the teachers on thing. I kind of like the, I like this, but I'm, I'm 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 giving you a disclaimer before I say it because I'd have to look at the Hebrew. It was Greek. It's New Testament. Anyway, I had to look at it to make sure of this, but this, anyway, let me just spit out what it was. The way it says, treat them, 
the person in habitual sin, treat them as a non-believer, we assume that means to kick them out. And it probably does. This person was saying no. This person was arguing, not, not no. You, you do separate yourself from them. But what do you do to a non-believer within the church? Excuse me, not within the church. What do you do to a non-believer in the whole world? You try to bring them in. So what, he, what he's saying, the connotation is in the New Testament, is you treat them as a believer. You assume they are lost, and you bring them back to God. That's what the argument is. That's what it means to treat them as a non-believer. It means to literally look at them as they're probably, and that's kind of what we're saying. Habitual sin may mean that you're not truly giving your loyalty over to God. And so we, New Testament evangelical Christians tend to read that as kick them out. So if you're hardcore fundamentalist, we're going to start booting homosexuals out of the church. Well, I have to get off into so many of these because you do separate shit. You don't swing the door open and, and condone a lifestyle. But what does God tell you to do to that homosexual? What does he tell you to do to that person struggling with alcoholism? And, you and, too are what's entrapped by sin. Yeah, yes. yes. Get, yeah, so, so, so what it means to treat them as a non-believer is you minister to them and you bring them back to the family you just like you would your neighbor who's, who's an atheist. The invitation. Yeah. You're the invitation. You have to go back and invite them again because they're not really in the family. Isn't that cool? I just thought that was an interesting way of looking at that. Plus, you don't carve out that space to say it's okay, you're fine. We're good. Yes, you gotta, yes. still got to repent. We have to hold righteousness. And I was going to say, this, I've never had this thought before, but what's happening right now that we were just talking about at the beginning of class with the culture and the world, it seems like Satan is disarming us yes. from being able to minister to people at that time. We're not able to speak truth to them and allow them to hear that because it's not proper, it's not accepted. Absolutely. Because it's not accepted. That's the end game of all this public ministry. Because we, we do get it. That's the whole Just thing. Just another mess up being right. thrown in our sofa again. Yeah. We, we so quickly put our moral, our, we, we turn the gospel into, into a moral, exclusively into a moral structure. And it is. I mean, Paul, read Paul. He's constantly calling you back to righteousness. If you read all of his letters, what does Paul always do? The first half of the letter is talking about, it's always in some form of how, whether it's Ephesians, Colossians, all of the first Corinthians, he, he starts with a theological, deep, hard to understand sometimes, theological explanation of what's happening in the unseen realm and the kingdom and the battle. That's what all of his letters are doing. And then at some point, he always throws the word, therefore, and then he gets dead specific and what is that because of what god has done for you and all that theological talk he did first he then says to your responsibility is righteousness do not and then, then he gets to his do not and it's very specific where it starts saying the homo, the homosexual the this the that the that the it, you know it's outside the kingdom of god and if you watch paul that's the paul what well, paul what he's arguing there it's not a moral argument what he's arguing is you are righteous and moral when you understand what God did for you. Yes. And it's the response to that that in you brings out righteousness because you want to please your Heavenly Father because you're in awe of what He did for you. If you think of all of Paul's letters in that outline and then read them, you realize he does it in every single one of his letters. Heavy theology. And then it's dead hard on, on what the person criticizing the church to see you, you, you Christians are always just given a, a to do list. It's not a to-do list so that you please God. It's a reaction to what you've done. And that's, that's Paul's explanation every time. Anyway, it's to show your believing loyalty. What's that? Yeah, it's to show your yeah. believing loyalty. Yeah, you show your believing loyalty, and it's a response to what he does. <laughs> Jump in there, because we got just enough time for that video, probably. Okay, so thank you, Mark, for sharing your basic. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <Sorry, laughs> no, Mark. But honestly, y'all, I just feel like over the last probably two years, and then... Then with folks like you come in and studies the Bible so much, and you guys, and that that's that's good. That's what Paul means by working out your salvation. Think about these things. Understand this stuff. You know, like you were saying, there are things that are cut and dry and easy, and they are at, at the most fundamental righteousness level. How that plays out in your life sometimes it is a struggle. We need to talk about it. That's one thing. I, anyway, I just I appreciate what just happened over the last thirty five minutes. Me, because me. this matters. It matters that we struggle with these, and everybody in the room realizes that we're all struggling with this stuff. Um, one, one quick thing: last last Sunday, we we listened online. We were in Birmingham. 
This is the passage that the pastor went over, okay? 1 Peter 1.13. I want to get that in your head again before you watch this. Therefore, <laughs> no, he's not preaching today. No, therefore, therefore, this is Peter now. Therefore, this is the, my translation is net. This was not what Chip said, but therefore, get your minds ready for action. I love this translation because I, when, when we heard him and then we read it in the net, we stopped and listened to it again because when you read the translation that Chip was using and probably most of yours, it softens that. The net mm -hmm. does a great job. Therefore, get your minds ready for action. What have we been calling that in this cage? Engage the culture. What he's saying is, Paul says, all this stuff I just told, oh, excuse me, Peter says, all this stuff I just said, because of that, you prepare for action. That's a call to engage the culture. Therefore, get your minds ready for action by being fully sober and set your hope completely on the grace that will be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed. Like obedient children, Think about that. Like obedient children, do not comply with the evil urges you used to follow in your ignorance. But, like the Holy One who calls you, become holy yourselves in all your conduct. For it is written, you shall be holy because I am holy. And if you address as Father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, each one's work, so me and G, there is work you have to do, which we would have talked about today. We'll talk about it next week. <laughs> Live out your time on your temporary residence here in reverence or fear of the Lord. Okay. Okay, so all that That's is the setting that we're going to do. And the only word that we're going to say here is that holiness, that is such a spiritual word, we can't get our hands around it. This video gets your head around that. I love the picture of holiness here. Yeah. And it has cosmic geography. It's a picture so much of life. And for most people, this idea is really just connected to being a morally good person. So God is holy because he's morally perfect. Yeah, that is part of it. But in the Bible, the idea of holiness is even bigger and more rich. What it's really describing is how God is the creative force behind the whole universe. He's the one and only being with the power to make a world full of such beauty and life. And so all these abilities, they make God utterly unique, which is the meaning of the word holy. So a helpful way to think about God's holiness is by using the sun as a metaphor. The sun is unique, at least within our solar system, and it's really powerful. It's the source of all this beautiful life on our planet. And so you could say that the sun is holy. And you can actually take this metaphor even further in that the whole area around the sun is also holy. Yeah, because the closer you get to the sun, the more tense it gets. Yeah, exactly. So that very power and goodness that generates all this life is also dangerous. dangerous. And the sun, if you get too close, will annihilate you. And in the same way, there's this paradox at the heart of God's own holiness. Because if you're impure, his presence is dangerous to you. And not because it's bad, but because it's so good. And so the first time we see this paradox of God's holiness, it's in the story of Moses and the burning bush. So God tells Moses to take off his sandals because he's standing on holy ground. And Moses covers his face in fear, and God says, hey, don't come any closer. It's intense. It's actually that intensity of God's holiness that's explored even more in the stories about Israel's temple, which was the main place where God's holy presence was located. And at the center of the temple was this room called the Most Holy Place. It's the hot spot of God's presence. And whether you're an Israelite living in the land around the temple or a priest working right in the temple, you're in proximity to God's holy presence, which is dangerous. Yeah, this is a problem. So how is it supposed to work? Well, in the Bible, the solution is that you need to become pure. I was going to ask Mary that she wants me to do that. We'll pause real quick. Me and Jensen right here. So he's talking about the temple. Think back. God set this up for the temple. We tend to think of the holy, holy of holies and all that here. Think back real quick. Um, the Exodus, you have Moses. God says he wants to meet with them, and he tells them very specific instructions. Moses is to go to the top of the mountain. The priests were to go about halfway up. What were the people to do? Don't touch, Don't it, touch it or you will die. Guess what that is? The court of the Gentiles, the holy, of, the holy place, and the holy of holies. The mountain itself on Sinai was structured this way because as you, there is a right way to approach God. And you do it the wrong way, 
And that's where the true fear of God, that's where the punishment, excuse me, that's where that's where it's dangerous. I love to throw this in here because it's, again, 21st century evangelical Christians, we hear all of our Christians, we're subject to our Christian music. You read Revelation. What's Sadly. Going, what are they flying around? What are the, what are the cherubim flying around saying? And we're subject to our Christian music. We think they're having a worship service. That's not what's going on. Do you know what they mean by holy, holy, holy? It's like a it's a, a gigantic flashing light. Warning, warning, warning. This is holy. You better approach it quickly. It's a danger warning. It's not a worship service. Not them saying that. It's a danger warning. <laughs> you never heard that part? Uh, yeah, That's what it is. They're saying, they're right saying you time. are approaching right. holy ground. The they're, that? The right. they're like, warning, yeah, that's, make that's, sure you're okay before you come in here. Right. Are you cool it's a warning, not a worship service. So, Isn't that cool? So that leads <laughs> right to this, what he's about to say yeah, about going. pure oh, being pure. It's being morally pure. Yeah, and that's easy enough to understand. But the Bible spends a lot of time talking about another kind of purity being ritually pure, which is a state where you separate yourself from anything related to death, like touching things like diseased skin or dead bodies or even certain bodily fluids. All these make you impure. And becoming ritually impure isn't necessarily sinful. What's wrong is waltzing into God's presence when you're in an impure state. Oh, okay. I'm going to quit pause this, but this is important. This is what I mean by we got to break this idea that as New Testament Christians, we tend to see everything through a morally right or wrong viewpoint. Not a bad thing, but there's a lot more going on in the Old Testament than just morally right and wrong. That's not what's going on here. Like what he just said, it's about ritual purity when you approach God. And I love what he just said, that this, it, it might blow past you when he just made a little statement. He said, even when it's not a good thing, I mean, even when it's not a bad thing, you're still ritually impure. What does, what does that mean? If you're in the Old Testament, well, yeah, if you're in the Old Testament. Menstrual cycles. Well, that too. But if you're in the Old Testament, yeah, menstrual cycles. You were ritually impure and had to cleanse, by, cleanse yourself and couldn't go into the temple for seven days. You didn't do anything wrong. It's not about right and wrong. It's about ritually impure. If you're walking along the road heading to the temple and you realize this guy just killed over dead and you tried to revive him, you're doing a really good thing. But you're also ritually impure and could not come into the presence of God. So in other words, it's not about right and wrong. It was about purity and how you approach God. Keep going. So now with that in mind, listen to this. this well, that's why God gave the Israelites very clear instructions for knowing when they were impure, steps to become pure, so that they could go into the temple again. So that's what the book of Leviticus is about. Right. But it doesn't stop there. This idea keeps developing. So later in the scriptures, we find this really interesting story by a prophet named Isaiah. And he has this crazy vision where he's in the temple and he's right in God's presence. He's totally terrified. Yeah, he knows the rules. He shouldn't even be in there. And he's worried about being destroyed. And then this crazy creature called a seraphim. Yeah, that is a crazy creature. <laughs> totally. So it flies over with a hot coal and then it sears Isaiah's lips with the coal and says something really weird. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. So this burning coal somehow makes Isaiah pure. Yeah, it's remarkable because normally if you touch something impure, it transfers its impurity to you. This and is cool. this new idea where you oh, have this is. coal, this very holy and pure object, and it touches Isaiah and it transfers its purity to him. Isaiah is not destroyed by God's holiness. He's transformed by it. I keep pausing because I want you to get this. You get this. In the Old Testament, anything you touched that was impure made you impure. You, you, like I said, even if you were trying to help somebody, but if they died and you touched them, now you became impure. The impurity and what Isaiah, what's happening here is this coal did the opposite. This coal transferred, or transferred purity. It did the exact opposite of what he was expecting. The implications of this are just huge, but there's one more development, this time from another prophet, Ezekiel, and he has this vision where he's standing at the temple, and he sees water trickling out from it, and then that water turns into a stream, and then it grows into a deep river that starts flowing through the desert, leaving this trail of green trees behind it, and then it flows into the Dead Sea, making everything fresh and alive. So instead of becoming pure first and then going into the temple, here God's holiness comes out from the temple, making things pure and bringing them to life. Isn't that interesting? What does it all mean? So we don't know until we meet this man, Jesus. Also, and he claimed, do you get it? The prophets were seeing what the Messiah would ultimately do, and they had no idea. They were just prophesying, probably had no idea. 
But what the Messiah would do is reverse that holiness. Instead of it would bring purity to you. And then we so see he's it fulfilling in all of these ancient visions, but in surprising new ways. So Jesus, he went around touching people who are impure. People with skin diseases, a, a woman with chronic bleeding, or dead people. And when he touches them, their impurity should transfer over to Jesus. But instead, Jesus' purity transfers to them and actually heals their body. Jesus, Jesus is like that holy coal in Isaiah's vision. Right. And Jesus claimed that he was the human embodiment of God's own holiness. And that he and his followers were now God's temple. So that through them, God's holy presence would go out into the world and bring life and healing and hope. Yeah, and so this doing. is why Jesus described his followers as having streams of living water flowing out of them. So oh. this is our part of the story where we find ourselves now. But where is this all headed? So the last pages of the Bible end with a final vision about God's holiness. And this time it's by a guy named John. And in his vision, we see the whole world made completely new. The entire earth has become God's temple. And Ezekiel's river is there, flowing out of God's presence, immersing all of creation, removing all impurity, and bringing everything back to life. Is that not incredible? See, all of a sudden now, the entire world, that's what Revelation is, the entire world is God's presence is here. The temple is here, and, and John describes it as that water that Ezekiel saw is now flowing over the whole world, and righteousness has returned. It's just, it's just incredible. A, a river where, 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 where boats are utilized with no oars. <laughs> because it flows. There's a current. So this goes back to what we were talking about, this mor being morally impure or having moral failures or con having sin in our life versus being ritually pure. Perspective. Jesus is the human embodiment of God's own holiness. Holiness is transferred to you. You are God's temple. Remember, they say that we You're hear God's that what? temple. Remember, we we hear that all over. You are God's temple. You are God's holy priesthood. Remember that we read that in second in First Peter last week. Through you, this is what he said. Through you, God's holy presence will go out into the world. You have streams of living water flowing out of you. And that's what the Great Commission is. Go into all the world and make the world a disciple them because you are the streams of living water. You have been in the presence of God and you are now to take him everywhere as he reclaims his family. Isn't it gorgeous? It's just a, you, know, you look at those things in Ezekiel and you, and you realize the whole Bible fits together. It's one integrated message system from outside our time domain. To quote, shut this up. Say it again. It's one integrated message system from outside our time domain. That's what your Bible is. The, oh, the Revelation, by the way, the reason most people can't understand Revelation is there are 400 verses and there are over 800 references to your Old Testament. The only way you understand Revelation is to first understand your entire Old Testament because that's what it's doing. It's taking the Old Testament and redefining it in light of the Messiah. Uh, one more great thought. One more great thought. Just think about the Old stuff. Testament and all the great men and women of the Old Testament. And did yes, there's right and wrong, and we none, none of us live up. There is black and white. But did any of them were any of them morally pure? No. No. They were struggling through this process, which is a lifelong but sanctification they, process. They were all. Seeking after God, walking humbly with their God. Because their belief in loyalty never shifted. That's right. That's right. Okay. <laughs> I love that. Pray, this pray. Is, you know, all this stuff is, yes, it's deep, and there's so much here, and your your Bible has all these analogies and all, but and what did, what did Jesus say on the road to, Dema the road to Damascus? Beginning with Moses and going all the way through the prophets. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. road to Emmaus. Beginning with Moses and through the prophets, he explained to them how. <laughs> and it's what your Old Testament is. That's why you don't separate the Old Testament from the New Testament like a lot of our young, young, you know, evangelical preachers these yeah, days. The Christ. Old Testament is gone. It is not gone. It's one integrated message system from outside our time domain. <laughs> Dear Lord, thank you. It's just amazing what you have done and what you have given to us and the depths. And we, we know this. We laugh at ourselves. Oh, we should. We're probably just scratching the surface. Mike Heiser knows today. 
who passed away two weeks ago, and he's sitting in your presence, and you were probably blowing his mind with all the things he didn't understand, all the things he didn't know, even though he was one of the smartest theologians I've ever heard. God, we know we're just scratching the surface, but even scratching the surface, it's amazing the depths and the riches of your word. May we apply it to our lives, and may we, in response, live out your righteousness. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Out of breath. That, that whole, this whole class Thank took a wild turn. That was hard. <laughs>